share. So here's a connective tissue PowerPoint right here that I just uploaded into our Canvas site. So you'll be able to, to grab that later on. <clears throat> All right. So the majority of this PowerPoint has a whole bunch of pictures in it that we're going to go over. So you have a, several different views of the connective tissues, all right, from the slides, <clears throat> which will help you out in identifying everything. So first off, let's get into some general characteristics of epithelial tissues. And I'll make some distinctions with um, some of the characteristics of the epithelial tissues that we covered last week. First of all, connective tissues is the most widely distributed tissue in the body. So it's, it's pretty much found everywhere. And it's the one of the most abundant of uh, variations of tissues that are in the body all over. There's a lot of examples of connective tissues that we're about to cover. Connective tissues have very few cells per volume of the tissue, which means the cells rarely touch each other. So the cells that make up the connective tissues are much different than the cells that make up the epithelial tissues that we covered last week. If you remember, epithelial tissues are stacked right on next to each other. They touch each other. More often than not, connective tissue cells are spread out, which means there's a lot of stuff around them, which is called the extracellular matrix, which I'm going to get into. All right. So before we, we do all of that, let's look at some of the names of these cells that somebody just brought up. So these that you see right here, fibroblasts and adipocytes, all of the names of these cells are specialized types of cells that are found in certain types of connective tissues. So some connective tissues will have them and some won't, and some will have their specific cells, and those cells won't be found anywhere else either. So you see right here, fibroblasts, the very first type of cell. These are the cells that are in connective tissues that produce the extracellular matrix of a connective tissue. And the extracellular matrix, which is the stuff on the outside of all the cells in the tissue, is made up predominantly of protein fibers. There's three protein fibers we have to cover. And a medium, which is called the ground substance. <clears throat> so the ground substance is uh, made up of these uh, sp very special types of polysaccharides, which are sugars um, called proteoglycans. And depending on the type of material that is in the ground substance, the connective tissues can either be soft, they can be hard like bone, they can be liquid, like blood is a liquid connective tissue, or they can be somewhat gelatinous, like kind of rubbery, like cartilage. So depending on what type of fiber and what type of ground substance, the consistency of the connective tissue is different. For instance, everybody knows bones are hard. That's because the extracellular matrix of bone has an abundant amount of calcium salts, solidified calcium all in our bone. So ultimately, uh, you'll have to know, you know, basically what you see here with the, the names of the cells and a little bit about what they do. So fibroblasts produce protein fibers and something called the ground substance. Adipocytes are a common name for them are fat cells. These are the cells that are found in adipose tissue, which I'll show you in a minute. And their role is to store energy in the form of oils called triglycerides. There are immune system cells that are scattered in certain types of connective tissues. And those immune system cells help protect us from invading microbes. All right. So uh, some of them are macrophages. I don't know if you ever heard of these before. Some of y'all probably have. Uh, these are the largest of the phagocytes in the body. They perform phagocytosis, which is engulfing or eating, cellular eating. So they engulf bacteria or other cellular debris, basically cleans up a wound site if you get a cut you know, or an abrasion or a burn or whatever. Um, mast cells are responsible for inflammation. And if you have a, a heightened inflammatory response uh, due to a particular substance, which would be called an allergen, then you have an allergy to it. Like some people are, are allergic to cats, right? So mast cells secrete molecules 
called inflammatory molecules that bring about these signs and symptoms of inflammation and or if it's an exaggerated inflammatory response, we would just call that an allergy. And then there's other white cells, white blood cells like neutrophils and eosinophils that are found in the connective tissues. The bone cells uh, are only found in the bone. Um, osteoblast, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. We're going to learn more about what these do when we cover the bone chapter. But I'll just let you know now that the osteoblast are the cells that make bone. They build new bone tissue up. Osteocytes are the mature bone cells that are living in your bone. And your bone is a living tissue. It's not just a hard substance in our body just sitting there. Your bone is very dynamic, changing all the time. Um, and osteoclasts are the cells that break down bony tissue. And there are certain times when we have to break down the bony matrix. And again, we're going to cover that reflex once we get into the skin and the bone chapter. Um, our cartilage cells include the immature cartilage cells called chondroblasts, the mature cartilage cells called chondrocytes. They're found obviously in cartilage. And the prefix chondro here means cartilage. In your blood, you have uh, blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, you probably know this already, and then platelets, which are referred to as uh, thrombocytes. So we're going to look at a slide of these different types of tissues and look at some of their cells as we get there. So what is the extracellular matrix? Well, it's everything that's between the cells. So since connective tissue cells are fairly spread apart, and they rarely touch each other. That means the space that is between them has to be filled up with something. It's not just empty space. So there's stuff between all the cells. So all the material that's between on the outside of cells separating them out is called the extracellular matrix. And it's predominantly made up of protein fibers and this ground substance that I was mentioning before. Epithelial tissue cells, since they touch each other, Typically, they lie very close to each other and touch. That means they have very little extracellular matrix because they don't have very much room between the cells. There's a little bit of room, but there's not a whole lot of room. So they don't have a whole lot of extracellular matrix. So the protein fibers that we're, you need to learn are collagen fibers. That's the one that everybody probably knows about because of collagen fillers and all of that. Um, reticular fibers. Uh, which are found in specific types of connective tissues, um, and then elastic fibers. So the collagen fibers and reticular fibers are very strong and sturdy type fibers, and they, they allow the tissue to resist uh, tensions that are applied at different angles. And elastic fibers are exactly what the name implies. They, they allow stretching. They allow a tissue to stretch and then recoil back to its original shape without being damaged. Ground substance is uh, basically either a calcified substance like in bone, which is a hard matrix. So the ground substance in bone basically is our calcium salts, or it can be liquid as in blood and the ground substance is basically water. So we can go all the way from being liquid to hard with being gelatinous like uh, the cartilage, as I was mentioning before. So we're not going to go over all of the different types of polysaccharides that make up ground substance and as of right now, um, but we will get into a little bit about what the, the bony matrix is when we do the bone chapter. Now, last week when we covered the epithelial tissues, I told you that epithelial tissues are avascular. There's no blood vessels that run through the tissue cells. So all of the cells in epithelial tissue have to get all their nutrients and oxygen from the blood that is flowing in the vessels in an underlying connective tissue. So most of the connective tissues in the body are very vascular, which is exactly opposite to epithelial tissues. But there are a couple of examples of connective tissues that are avascular. And I'm going to tell you what they are as we get there. Now, the next slide just shows a term that we have to know uh, as far as where do the connective tissues come from during development of the fetus in the uterus. So while the 
the baby is growing there or, or, you know, the fetus is growing into being a baby in utero, there are what we call embryonic tissues. The connective tissues come from an embryonic tissue called mesenchyme. So we have to know that most of the connective tissues arise from cells in what we call mesenchyme, and the mesenchyme contains the cells called mesenchymal cells. And we refer to them as stem cells. If you've never heard of a stem cell before, those are types of cells that have the ability to differentiate or develop into other types of cells in the body. So the mesenchymal stem cells in the embryo have the ability to develop into the other types of connective tissue cells that I just mentioned in the earlier slide. So this is just to, to let you know where the, during development, where the connective tissues come from. It comes from this type of embryonic tissue. <coughs> now, we need to know how the connective tissues are broken down by category. Depending on the tissue type, it's lumped into a different category, and that all depends on its characteristics and really what makes it up. So the connective tissues are lumped into two major groups, what we call connective tissue proper or just uh, basically uh, connective tissue in general, and then what we call specialized connective tissues. So the connective tissue proper then has two categories. If the connective tissue has a whole bunch of protein fibers in the extracellular matrix, we refer to that as loose connective tissue. Or if it do doesn't have, um, if it has more space in the cells that make it up, we call it loose connective tissue. Dense connective tissue, on the other hand, are the connective tissues where the protein fibers are more densely packed together. So there's the, the fibers are very, very packed in those tissues and it makes that tissue very dense. So the loose connective tissues, the fibers are there, but they're kind of all over the place. And in dense connective tissues, they're, they're stacked together very tightly. And we're gonna cover each one of these types of connective tissues. So when you're studying at home, you should know that adipose uh, tissue is considered to be a loose connective tissue. You should know that dense irregular connective tissue is a dense connective tissue, so forth and so on. As far as the specialized tissues are concerned, we have cartilage and bone and blood. There are three different types of cartilages that we have to cover, hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. So obviously in their name, it says cartilage, so you're gonna know their cartilage. Over here with, where it says three Bs, it has three here because there's actually two types of bone tissue in our bones, in our skeletal system. There's something called compact bone and then there's spongy bone. We're gonna look at these in more detail when we cover the bone uh, in the bone chapter, but I will uh, have you guys look at the structure of compact bone in this packet. And then we have blood. So these are called the three Bs, two types of bone and then the blood, all right? <clears throat> so here is just the text information that goes along with the flow chart we just looked at. Here's the tissue proper with the breakdown of uh, loose uh, and dense connective tissues um, and some of the characteristics in them. Specialized connective tissues over here, special types of cells uh, found in specific types of systems in the body, which we're about to cover. Where are the three different types of cartilages found? What are the roles of those cartilaginous pads and where they're located? What is compact bone, right? So again, we're gonna cover more of this when we do uh, the bone chapter, but at least for now, we have to know there's two types of bone and then blood obviously is a very specialized connective tissue and everybody knows what blood is already, but we're gonna cover it. All right, so let's get into our first loose connective tissue. Areolar connective tissue is pretty much uh, the most widely distributed of the connective tissues in the body. And we're about to cover uh, its characteristics, structure, locations, and functions in a minute. But before I do that, look at this picture of areolar connective tissue. Areolar connective tissue should be one of the easier ones for you to identify, no matter what color stain that you're looking at. 
if you see a whole bunch of different looking fibers on the screen, looks like a whole bunch of little hairs on here. Some of them are thick, some of them are thinner, some of them are short and branching. Uh, all of these different fibers are the protein fibers I just mentioned. We have collagen fibers, reticular fibers, elastic fibers, um, all in this tissue with scattered cells everywhere. So wherever you see this little round thing, that's the nucleus of a cell in there. The majority of these, not all of them, like this is a white blood cell, but the ones that have these elongated nuclei like this, those are called fibroblast, fibroblast. Areolar connective tissue has an abundance of the different types of cells in here. You're not gonna be able to identify each type of cell, but they have uh, neutrophils and eosinophils, macrophages in there, all sorts of other white blood cells, all scattered through this areolar connective tissue. So let's look at some of the characteristics before we get into the other pictures of them. So you, you have a few different views to look at, all right? So these tissues are, contain the most fibroblasts because those fibroblasts are producing all of those fibers that we just looked at. The thickest of the fibers that are found in that connective tissue are the collagen fibers. And then the thinner ones would be the elastic and the reticular fibers. The elastic fibers typically are a little bit longer um, and the reticular fibers are, have more branching patterns to them that are in there. So if you go in your book, you can you know, look at where they say elastic, you can see the elastic fiber in here, and then you can see this reticular fiber right here. Um, and then the thickest ones in there are the collagen fibers. So ultimately that areolar connective tissue, you can see there's an abundance of space everywhere. So all of that empty looking space, it's not just empty. There's some ground substance in there. It's kind of a slippery uh, fluid. And I'll just let you know, if you've, ever, if you've ever taken the skin off of a chicken, like to cook, and you see this clear slimy stuff, that clear slimy stuff is areolar connective tissue. Because one of the places that areolar connective tissue is found is under the skin, or what we call the hypodermis. So I don't know if you know this term yet because we haven't covered the skin, but uh, areolar connective tissue is found underneath pretty much all epithelial membranes that we covered last week. All epithelial tissues had that basement membrane. So lying just beneath that basement membrane is areolar connective tissue. It's also found in abundance just under the, the skin or under the lower layer of the skin called the dermis. And so the layer that's below the dermis is just called the hypodermis. All right. And again, we're going to look at how to identify the, you know, the uh, portions of the skin when we do the skin chapter. Now, as far as the function of areolar connective tissue, it has a supportive function. It also contains blood vessels in it. So it helps anchor, anchor all of the epithelial tissues down uh, where they are, the membranes down where they are in the body. It provides the nutrients from the blood that runs in the blood vessels inside the areolar connective tissue. And it's a binding tissue. It helps fill up all the gaps and it binds other structures together where it's, where it's located. And here's just some other pictures of it. You see, this is a, a, another, a different type of stain. So you see this little squiggly line right here? That's an elastic fiber. So it's all twisted up. That allows this to uh, have some flexibility to the tissue. This, these other thin, longer branching fibers are reticular fibers. And the thickest of the darkest branches in there are collagen fibers that we see. And then all of these little dark circles are the nuclei of various types of cells. So how do you know what a fibroblast looks like? Well, fibroblasts typically have elongated nuclei like this. So I know that's a fibroblast. This is a fibroblast. This is one over here, right? So this is just one type of stain. You see it looks a lot different than this picture. But there's one constant that you can see in all the different types of pictures with areolar. There are these fibers that are everywhere. So you won't see this many protein fibers in the other connective tissues when you're looking at them. So this one should be one of the easier ones to identify, well, along with a couple other ones. So, and look on this one, you see the, the fiber that's all squiggled up? That's the elastic protein fibers. 
the ones that are thinner but uh, and have the little branch to it but aren't squiggled up, those are reticular fibers. And the big, at least in this stain, the big, thick pink ones, those are collagen fibers. All right. All right. So does anybody have any questions about areolar connective tissue? So if you were looking at this under a microscope physically in a lab, that will, that's what we would be doing today. You would be looking at a couple of different slides, focusing down on it so you can, and I, I typically make my students in lab draw what they see. Because if you can force yourself to draw a little bit of what you see, even if you don't draw very well, because I don't either, it helps your brain organize what things look like, all right? So obviously this one has all these little strings everywhere. So hopefully you'll be able to identify that one fairly easily. Now adipose tissue is another one that is kind of easy to identify. You can see here from the, the graphic or just a drawing of it, um, what the cells look like. Because if you look at just a, a slide of, of adipose tissue, it looks like it's a whole bunch of circles that are just empty. And they basically are. Look at the cell over here in the drawing. This is the adipocyte right here. So in the middle of the adipocyte is a, a, a basically a droplet of oil. Adipocytes have the job of storing fat. That's what they do. These are fat cells. And they store fat in a form of an oil called triglycerides. And the triglycerides that they store, it has a lot of energy value to it. There's a lot of calories per gram in fat. So if our body needs more calorie containing uh, food items, molecules to make ATP, but we're not taking any in, we can go and start breaking down our fat stores. And that's what happens when you start to decrease your calorie intake and you work out. You start to burn the fat that is being stored in these cells and the cells start to get smaller. So here is a slide of adipose tissue. You can see it just looks like a bunch of hollow circles everywhere. And the oil uh, droplets that they would store, it would be in the middle of the cell in here. So let's look at uh, the structure, uh, information and function and location, all right? So the name of the cell in adipose tissue is called adipocytes. Obviously, we need to know that. You need to know that adipocytes store oil or fat in the form of triglycerides. This is that light oil that's being stored inside the cell. Um, the cells look kind of hollow because upon fixation of the stain and fixing the slide, um, the triglycerides are removed. So that's why, at least in certain types of stains, the cells look hollow, all right? They have very few fibers that are between the cells in this particular connective tissue. And even upon staining, we can, you can barely see them anyway. So we never really show visible fibers in there. All right. Um, some people say that it looks like marshmallows all on the field of view. That was, you know, just a little reminder. You can uh, write down whatever you think it looks like when you're writing down your notes or studying, you know. Um, so it stores oil in the form of triglycerides, and that is used to make ATP energy. I guess I should have put that in there. The triglycerides are broken down in order to make ATP. And so you learn that in, in general biology, um, aerobic respiration. And fats, or the components of fats, which are called ketones, actually enter aerobic respiration in the mitochondria in the Krebs cycle. Everybody kind of hated learning that, right? Um, and we'll talk more about ketones when we get to AMP2, because if you have somebody that's burning a whole lot of fat all at once, um, in the absence of uh, allowing your cells to use sugar, a person can go into what's called ketoacidosis. Uh, ketones build up in, in the blood. And so we'll talk about that. That comes from the breakdown of fat. Um, the location of fat below your skin, the hypodermis, we have a fat pad down there, all right? Um, it's also distributed around the major organs, even though I didn't put it in here. You have a fat pad around your kidneys, some around your liver, around your heart. Um, it's used for cushioning to protect these organs, but it's also used as an energy reserve, as I was mentioning before. There's also what we call yellow marrow which is found in, in the middle of long bones, like the bones of your legs and arms, the middle of those bones are hollow. And in the middle of those bones, 
where the hollow space is, which is called the medullary cavity, is fat. And that fat that's inside the bone is called yellow marrow. So here are just some other pictures of it. You can see the cells look hollow in the middle. The oil has, you know, triglyceride is missing in some of these. Might have some left in there, but you can see it on another view. So here is the adipocyte. Here's the nucleus of the adipocyte. So they may make you point to this and they'll say, okay, identify this cell and it's pointing to this nucleus. Or they'll ask you what this part is. So if you ever see the cell and you see the nuclei typically always stain a purple stain, um, there are some exceptions to that. That's the nucleus of the adipocyte if you see it on the circle like that. All right. Just another view of it, adipose tissue right here. And this one, you can kind of see some of the fibers in there, but the identifying character is this hollow space. Another one right here. This is actually a section of muscle tissue right here. We're gonna, we're gonna cover that in uh, the muscle chapter, but um, in and around your muscle, there, there, a little fat pad in there. So here's the adipose tissue. So I can see more than one tissue type on this field of view. There's some muscle fibers in here and there's some adipose tissue in here. All right, the next type of connective tissue is reticular connective tissue. This is another type of loose connective tissue. So in reticular connective tissue, you can see there's an abundance of little bitty cells everywhere. A lot of these cells are just called reticular cells. And the reticular cells are the special type of cells that are gonna help build these little thick branching protein fibers that we see in here. So here's a real micrograph of it um, that you're gonna have to identify. And you can see all of the black lines in here is a very identifying characteristic of any tissue type that has reticular fibers in it, by the way. So you can see the little short branches going off in either directions here or there. This is a very strong tissue type. So let's go over some of its structure and functions. And I got to teach you a couple of terms here. So the many cells that we see in there are called reticulocytes. They are the cell, the special cells that, that secrete the reticular protein fiber and they are short branching fibers that basically form the framework of the organ that is located in. I'll say that again. All of those reticular fibers are very strong and sturdy. It gives strength and support to the tissues that it's found in. So it, its role is to form what is called the framework of an organ and the framework or basically maintaining the structure of an organ is called the stroma. And the easiest example I can give you of what stroma is, is it would be analogous to the two by four framing in the walls of your house. Yeah, you can see the wall from the outside, but what's really holding the wall up? The two by fours in there are supporting the wall. So, the two by fours in the wall would be considered the stroma of your house because it forms the framework of it. All right. Now, some locations of reticular connective tissue in your liver in special structures of the lymphatic system called lymph nodes. I'm sure you heard of those before. We're going to cover this more specifically in AMP2 and in the spleen. It's also found in red bone marrow, which is located in certain parts of bones in our body, which we'll cover in the bone chapter. But um, in these areas, sorry about that, my email keeps going off. In these areas, we have the framework of these soft tissues is formed by reticular connective tissue. So let's look at another slide of it. Here's reticular connective fibers that you see in here, all the little reticular sites everywhere, little circles. And so these thick, uh, short, branching, dark fibers is what gives the tissue its structure and it helps maintain its shape. 
So they're very strong and sturdy fibers. They run in all directions to give support in three dimensions, all within the tissue. All right, let's do uh, the dense connective tissue, dense regular connective tissue, the very first one. So dense regular connective tissue kind of has a very distinctive look to it. Um, when I was in lab, people said it looks like bacon. Um, other students said, no, I think it looks like Raymond noodles, you know, just some silly little ways of trying to remember what, which tissue it is. And so you see these wavy lines right here and there's a regular pattern. This is called dense regular connective tissue because the collagen fibers in there, number one, are densely packed together. And this tissue is, is highly concentrated with collagen fibers, very strong protein fiber. And it's called regular because the fibers run at parallel rows with each other. They're in this regular pattern. So it's called dense because the collagen fibers are densely packed. It's called regular because the fibers run at a regular pattern in parallel rows. So let's look at this. There is, uh, I have a few fibroblasts in there that produce all the fibers thick bundles of collagen fibers that run at regular patterns with one another. They have a wavy appearance, uh, typically due to shrinkage uh, when, we, when we make this, the tissue, and that's what gives it that wavy appearance. This particular tissue is one of really two types of connective tissues in the body that is avascular. Remember I said earlier, most connective tissues are vascular. So this is one that is avascular, which means, let me go back to the picture. There's no blood vessels that run through this tissue, right? So ultimately, um, this tissue has to receive the cells that are in the tissue that form the protein fibers, those fibroblasts that are the few fibroblasts that are in there, get what they need to live from blood vessels that lie on the outside of the structure where the dense regular connective tissue is located. So dense regular connective tissue forms all of your tendons and ligaments in the body. So a tendon, if you don't know, is the sturdy structure that attaches a muscle to a bone so that when we contract our muscle, it pulls on a tendon, which then pulls on the bone and we get movement. Ligaments are the dense regular connective tissue structures that hold bone to bone. So you might hear about an athlete that ruptured an ACL. I'm sure people heard of that before. Oh, they have an ACL, you know, and they have to go get it fixed. Well, the anterior cruciate ligament is one of the primary ligaments in a knee joint. So ligaments hold bone to bone, tendons hold muscle to bone. Very strong attachments. So this tissue helps resist tension pretty much in a single direction back and forth unlike reticular connective tissue that we just finished, since the fibers are branching in all directions, it can resist tension in multiple directions. So um, dense regular, since the fibers go in a regular pattern, can resist tension in the direction that the fibers are going in. All right, so here's another diagram of it. Right here, you see the little wavy pattern. Those are obviously the collagen fibers. Um, where you see a dark circle that's kind of elongated, there, here, here, right here, those are the nuclei of the fibroblast that produce the, the protein fiber. So typically the darker purple areas is where, if you have to identify it, is the fibroblast that, pro that produce the collagen fiber. Here's another picture of it, slightly different stain color. But ultimately, there's a common theme here. You see all the protein fibers are densely packed together side by side, and they run at this regular pattern in parallel rows. So there's a fibroblast, there's a fibroblast, here's a nucleus of a fibroblast. So you can see a couple of them in there, and some of them get squished together. But out beside them are the collagen fibers. Here's another picture of it, a little wavy pattern just to give you several different views of it. This is, this is another slide of it. So just to give you another perspective, it's a little uh, 
lower magnification so you can't see the wavy pattern as much, but you can see this, the collagen fibers are still running at this regular pattern up and down in, in this particular slide. All right, so let's move into the irregular, dense irregular connective tissue. It's still a dense connective tissue and it's called a dense connective tissue because again, there's a whole bunch of collagen fibers that are densely packed together all over the place. It's called irregular because the collagen fibers don't have a regular pattern. Some run in this direction, some run in that direction, some run behind and out of the plane of the board. So in all directions, these collagen fibers are running. So that's why we call it a dense irregular connective tissue. So all of this, it looks like a splattered pink everywhere in there. You know when you see this, kind of a splattered pink everywhere like this, that you're looking at dense irregular connective tissue. Right now, dense irregular connective tissue is very, very vascular. There's a whole bunch of blood vessels in there. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. All right, so a whole bunch of blood vessels in there running through our dense irregular connective tissue. So let's look at some of the features, what it does and where it's located. So obviously we have densely packed collagen fibers, but there's no regular pattern. So they run in different directions. That's why it's called irregular. We still have those few fibroblasts uh, in there that are scattered around that produce the collagen fibers. And the gaps that are between the collagen bundles, where you, where you see space, that is an artifact of fixation. So when we take a section through a tissue and we fix it, on the slide that's called fixation and it causes the collagen fibers that are running at different patterns with each other to pull apart from each other and that's why we see it looks like there's space in here but in the in a living organism where it's located it, there's no real space there the collagen fibers are still packed together but they just run at different directions so since those collagen fibers run at all different directions that tissue is very good at resisting tension in multiple directions. Unlike dense regular is very strong in this one direction in the direction that the collagen fibers run and dense irregular connective tissue. Some of the fibers run that way, this way, this way, all over. So those fibers can resist tension in multiple directions. Dense irregular connective tissue forms the thickest part of our skin, which is called the dermis. So it's found in the dermis of the skin. In fact, some of these slides that we're about to look at, even the previous one, um, whoops, is pretty much a slide that would come from the dermis of the skin. It's not only located there though, it, it's, it forms, this type of tissue forms membranes, dense connective tissue membranes around other tissues in the body. Like around your bone, there's a membrane. It's called the periosteum. So that's the membrane that surrounds your bone. The, at least two of the three types of cartilages that have a membrane around it, that membrane around cartilage is called a perichondrium. The very outer part of our muscle is called the epimysium. That's formed by dense irregular connective tissue. And then there's a membrane around the outside of nerves. That's called an epineurium. So these are the science names for the connective tissues that surround those structures. This is also the type of tissue that forms the heart valves, which I'm sure you guys know you have valves in your heart. Those valves are formed by dense irregular connective tissue. So let's look at some slides of it. So here, dense irregular connective tissue, a slide taken from the dermis of the skin, and you can see it kind of splattered pink everywhere and this, the artifact of fixation, we could see the little spaces where there would be differences in the direction of the fibers. So that's one. Here's another one. You see a brighter pink, right, all in there. And right there's a fibroblast where you see the little darker areas of fibroblast, that little fibroblast there, right there, right here. So those little darker purple areas are fibroblasts. They lay down the collagen fibers. Here's another view of 
uh, dense irregular connective tissue, and you can see the nuclei of some of the fibroblasts that would lay down those protein fibers. And so even though the stains look a little different, there's a common theme here as well. No matter if it's a light pink, a dark pink, or this more maroon looking color, these are the collagen fibers. And when you see that it, they're kind of just no rhyme or reason to it, it kind of looks like it's just splattered on the field of view, you know you're looking at dense irregular connective tissue. Here's another diagram of it right here. A little splat, different coloration, but you can see how we have this splattering effect of the fibers that run in different directions, right? All right, so let's get into the last of the dense connective tissues, which is elastic connective tissue. So the identifying character in this elastic connective tissue, sort of like what we saw in reticular connective tissue, are going to be these dark fibers that we see everywhere. All right. So these dark fibers are, and it, it kind of has like a little squiggly to it. These are the elastic fibers. So we, elastic connective tissue obviously is called that because it's loaded down with elastic protein fibers where it's located. And so when you start seeing these little thick wavy lines like this, you know you're looking at elastic connective tissue. Here's a couple other pictures of it right here. Some elastic connective tissue. This is a section taken from the aorta. Same thing here. Whoops, my bad. Same thing in this picture. See the little squiggly lines everywhere? Those are the elastic fibers. So what is it, where is it, and what does it do, right? So the dark wavy bundles we see are the elastic fibers. They uh, are scattered in between by, uh, in some stains you can see it better than other ones, uh, pink collagen fibers. So that's what all of this pink that is in here. So it's a scattering of the collagen fibers, but the identifying character again are the elastic fibers. It function in allowing the tissue to stretch. So the tissues where elastic connective tissue is located it allows the tissue to stretch and then bounce back or recoil back to its original size. The reason for that is because the elastic fibers store energy, much like a spring does. So if you, if, if you uh, compress a spring, it'll bounce back. Or if you stretch a rubber band, it snaps back because it's elastic, all right? Um, it's located in large arteries in the body like the aorta, and that's where this picture was taken from. This is a section of the wall of the aorta, the largest artery in the body. And in a portion of the wall, we can see these dark elastic fibers all in there. The other place that we have it that I want you to know is around your lungs. Everybody knows when you breathe in, you inhale, your lungs blow up like balloons, and then we exhale, and of course your lungs go back to their normal size. One reason why they do that is because our lungs are loaded down around them with elastic connective tissue because, well, let's face it, it's elastic, allows the organ to stretch and then recoil back to its normal shape. All right, so before we leave those dense connective tissues, can everybody still hear me? Yes. All right, very good. All right, now what we're gonna do is get into some of the special connective tissues. Uh, we're gonna get into cartilages. There's three types of cartilages. The first cartilage that we're gonna cover um, is a very widely distributed cartilage in the body. It's called hyaline cartilage. And so let's look at a couple of things first off before we get into everything about it. Cartilage is somewhat pliable. One of the types of cartilages is very strong and sturdy, um, but still it's not hard like bone. So it's kind of pliable. Um, almost like a, a rubbery type of a consistency to it. So if we look at the diagram over here, a section that a, a slide that was taken from a fetal skeleton. So the, when we are developing in utero, the fetus, our entire skeletal system starts off as being hyaline cartilage. And then this hyaline cartilage has to be converted into bone. You're gonna learn uh, about that when we do the bone chapter. 
But nonetheless, if we look in here, we see a, these you know, strange little circles everywhere. And in between the circles, we kind of see this smooth area that takes on the purple or pinkish uh, coloration, depending on the type of stain. Over here, you kind of see it's, it's kind of a, a grayish or a bluish color. But that smooth coloration in there is the ground substance of cartilage. And I'll just tell you now, the ground substance in this cartilage is called chondroitin sulfate. Uh, we're going to learn that later, but chondroitin sulfate. And so these little circles that we see in the matrix, in the ground substance of the extracellular matrix, these little holes are called lacunae, plural lacuna, with an A on the end is singular. So the little, there's little bitty holes in this matrix. And the hole is where the chondrocyte lives. So this is the lacuna over here, and that's the chondrocyte in the middle of it. Here's a, a lacuna filled up with a chondrocyte. So that's the nucleus of a chondrocyte right there. Same thing here. Here's the lacuna, the circle, and the chondrocyte is living inside that hole. Because the matrix, even though it's not completely hard, it is somewhat solid, you know? So the cells have to have a little space, a little bubble, if you will, inside this matrix where the cells live. So from this point forward, you'll know that the word lacuna or lacuni with the E on the end, plural, means a hole in the connective tissue matrix where the connective tissue cell lives. And the reason why I say it like that is because you have lacuni in cartilage, but we also have lacuni in bone. So in bony matrix, the lacuna is filled in with the bone cell, not a, not a cartilage cell. So here's the chondrocyte in here in the lacuna, all right? So let's look at uh, some specifics about hyaline cartilage. First of all, the chondrocytes live in the holes called lacunae, and you see this is plural. Um, typically in hyaline cartilage, you don't see the collagen fibers too much, uh, and that's why it takes on a more smooth or glassy appearance. And what I mean to say by that is the matrix in the mid, on the outside of the lacunae everywhere, that matrix is, is smoother looking. That's gonna be one of the identifying characteristics. How smooth does the matrix out here look? Or can you see some dark fibers in there, right? So typically you don't see the fibers too well in hyaline cartilage. Although there are some fibers there, they're not as noticeable, all right? Um, they typically take a, a pinkish to a bluish stain, uh, a little bit better than the other connective tissues. Um, and this tissue, all cartilage for that matter, is avascular. So the two, I'll reiterate that, the two types of connective tissues that are avascular, which means they don't have blood vessels running through them, are the cartilages that we're covering now <clears throat> and dense regular connective tissue. And so dense regular connective tissue, remember, forms tendons and ligaments. So tendons and ligaments don't have any blood vessels running through them. Now, there are blood vessels that go to the outside of them, but they don't run through it. Same thing with cartilage. There's no blood vessels that run through the matrix here. But th if this was a cartilaginous pad, there would be blood vessels to the outside of it. They just wouldn't go through the cartilaginous pad. All right, so they're avascular. Now, hyaline cartilage does have that dense, irregular connective tissue membrane around it, which I mentioned earlier was called a perichondrium. Not all cartilages have it, but hyaline cartilage pads have a membrane around it called the perichondrium. Its main role is for support and protection. However, hyaline cartilaginous pads are also found at the ends of our bones, which is forming a uh, smooth surface at our joints. So it smooths out movement and allows for a lubricant or lubrication uh, at our joints. So if anybody has, say, a cartilaginous arthritis in a joint that's damaging the cartilage, when they go to move the bones at that joint, it hurts because there's a lot of friction. When the cartilage is damaged, there's a lot of friction between the moving parts of the bone. So this helps smooth out the movements at joints in the body. It is the weakest of the cartilages, though. Come on. 
it is the weakest of the cartilages uh, out of the three that we have to cover just because it has the fewest fibers in it. That's all. Uh, but it, just because I say it's the weakest, it doesn't mean that it's not important. It's very important. All right. So where is it located? Well, our entire skeleton starts off as being hyaline cartilage. So the entire fetal skeleton um, at the ends of long bones, those little pads at the ends of long bones at our joints, those are called, the little pads of hyaline cartilage are called articular cartilages. So we have the articular cartilaginous pad at the end of our bones, helps smooth out movement at the joint. Um, it forms our growth plates. I'm sure you've heard of that before. Some of y'all might even know the name of the, the science name for the growth plate, which is called the epiphyseal plate. So as we are children growing into adults, before we stop growing tall, the area where our bones get longer is at the growth plate. And the growth plate is a pad of hyaline cartilage. Um, the cartilage that is associated with your ribs, everybody knows you have your, you know, it's a rib cage, you got your ribs and you have some cartilaginous strips from the ribs. Those are hyaline cartilaginous strips. Um, some parts of our nose is hyaline cartilage. Um, your windpipe, which is called the trachea, is formed by hyaline cartilage. And then your voice box itself, at least a majority of it, is, uh, which is called the larynx, is made of hyaline cartilage. There is a, a, an area that has elastic cartilage in it, but the, the entire box itself, the voice box, the larynx, is surrounded by hyaline cartilage. So here's just another couple of pictures of it. This is a slide that is taken from your windpipe. It's one of the cartilaginous rings that make up your trachea. So this is called a tracheal ring. And you can see the little holes everywhere inside the matrix. Those are the lacunae where the chondrocytes are living in those little holes. And you can see that on the outside of the, the lacunae, the space is smooth. So it looks kind of smooth, like a glassy appearance. Here's another slide of it. Nice smooth appearance on the outside of the lacunae everywhere. That's gonna be different in the other cartilages. Just a couple other pictures of it. You can see it takes up this bluish stain quite well. And it makes a smooth appearance on the outside of the, uh, of the lacunae. Nice smooth appearance. Here's a little pinker or purple area. St this is all still hyaline cartilage, just different views of it. Here's another section of a tracheal ring. Looks more pink. But you see the lacunae in there and you see it's kind of smooth, right? Even though it's a pink color and not purple or blue, the matrix on the outside of the lacunae is smooth. That is different from this cartilage. So look at this cartilage. This is called elastic cartilage. And all cartilages, by the way, you're gonna have the lacuna where the chondrocytes live which are the, the lacuna are the holes, the chondrocytes are the cells. In elastic cartilage, there are an abundance of elastic protein fibers. Elastic cartilaginous pads also contain a perichondrium. So there's some collagen fibers out here. Remember, those, that connective tissue membrane is made of dense irregular connective tissue, which is predominantly collagen fibers. Here's a real photo of photomicrograph from a slide of elastic cartilage. And so all of the little holes are the lacunae again, where the chondrocytes are living. And then now though, on the outside of the holes, you see little protein fibers, these little filaments everywhere that are kind of dark staining. You know what that is? Those are elastic protein fibers. And they take up that dark stain. Very similar to when we looked at the elastic connective tissue earlier. This is just called elastic cartilage because it is a cartilage, but it's loaded down with elastic fibers. Now they still have some collagen fibers in there, but the identifying character on, in this cartilage are all of these dark staining fibers. That's the elastic fibers. So we still have chondrocytes living in holes called lacunae. 
there's a dark blue or black branching elastic fibers is your identifying characteristic. I still want you to know that this type of cartilage has a perichondrium, which is a dense irregular connective tissue membrane that surrounds it. So both hyaline cartilage and elastic cartilage have a perichondrium. This cartilage allows for flexibility. Since it has all of the elastic fibers in it, it allows the structure that contains elastic cartilage to be deformed and it bounces back to its regular shape. And so I'll put down here the location, the outer ear at least, what's called the auricle, the outer part of the ear that we see on the outside of the body. Everybody knows if you bend your ear, it just snaps back to its original shape. The reason for that is because it's loaded down, it is basically made of elastic cartilage. And then a part of our voice box, the larynx, one of the cartilaginous st structures in your larynx is called the epiglottis. We won't learn what this does until AMP2, but basically this piece of cartilage is elastic cartilage. And this is the cartilage that prevents food and drink from going down your windpipe when you swallow. It's called the epiglottis. So here are just some other uh, slides of it. Here's a slide from the ear. Now you can see a little higher magnification. The protein fiber is a little bit better. <clears throat> Here's the lacunae everywhere where the chondrocytes would be inside the little hole in there. Here is just another different view of it. But now you still see the lacunae, but again, the identifying character, the dark fibers that are very noticeable. As soon as you see the lacunae and you see these dark fibers, you know you're looking at elastic cartilage right off the bat. Just another little view of it, different coloration pattern, but all the little lacunae in here, all the little holes, but then all the little fibers you see, this is just on a lower magnification. This is higher magnification, slightly different stain uh, pickup, and this is lower magnification, but you can still see the little lacunae everywhere, and if you look close, Try and pay attention to what you're looking at. You can see little fibers or strings in there. All right, now, the strongest of the cartilaginous types in the body and the last type of cartilage. And all of these cartilages are avascular. The strongest type of cartilage is called fibrocartilage. Now, the reason why it's called fibrocartilage is because it is loaded down with a ton of collagen fibers. There's collagen fibers everywhere. And remember, collagen fiber, fibers are very strong, tough fibers that add strength and support to the tissues where it's located. So since in this cartilage, where we still have lacunae, you have large scattered lacunae with the chondrocytes in it, in between, out in the extracellular matrix, are a whole bunch of collagen fibers. Now, sometimes we'll see a stain where the collagen fibers are pink. And you, you're gonna know that this is uh, fibrocartilage because we have the large lacunae and then we have these collagen fibers. So how do I know this is a collagen fiber and not one of the other fiber types? Well, again, we're gonna see kind of this wave to it. And it's either going, you either we'll see a, a pink stain like this, and I'll just jump ahead for a second, or a more blue stain. So these blue stains, you can still see the, the wave of the collagen fiber in there. When you're looking at a reticular fiber in reticular connective tissue, you're gonna see uh, short, thick branching patterns everywhere, dark fiber. In elastic fibers, you're gonna see uh, a, a deep purple to a black fiber. These are either going to have this bluish tint to it or the pinkish tint for collagen fibers. So the college, uh, chondrocytes stack up and are stationed around thick bundles of collagen fibers, just like in this picture. You see it a little better in the diagram, but you can also see it right here. The lacunae with the uh, chondrocytes in it kind of stack up in between where the collagen fibers run. Now, it won't always look like this. It depends on the angle that the tissue was taken at. Look at this one. Chondrocytes kind of line up. Collagen fibers run between them, right? 
Now, uh, this particular cartilage is the strongest of all of them, so its main role is in support and protection. Support and protection. It's located in certain joints in the body. These cartilaginous pads are found in between the pubic bones of your hip joint, which we'll learn in the bone chapter, but it, that joint between the pubic bones is called the pubic symphysis. That's one type of joint. And then the discs that run in between the vertebrae in your vertebral column in your back, those are fibrocartilaginous pads. So when you hear somebody say, I got a herniated disc in my back, I'm sure you heard of that. Or they slipped a disc or something like that. They are referring to their intervertebral disc and it's basically a pad of fibrocartilage. You may have also heard of people that damage uh, parts of their knee joint. There are these dense fibrocartilaginous pads inside the knee joint that are called the menisces. A meniscus uh, with US on the end would be singular, menisci is plural. So these are special dense fibrocartilaginous pads found in a knee joint. And here's just a couple of slides of it. You can see the lacunae, and now you see the nucleus of the chondrocyte kind of looks more like a, a maroon, purpley, pinkish looking structure in there. But then the identifying character, there's your collagen fibers. And you see how the, the lacunae kind of stack in between the fibers. See it a little bit better right here is a stack, here's lacunae, and then the fibers just run by them. <clears throat> All right, we have a couple of types of tissue left to cover. Um, I know your brain's probably hurting, but I'm almost finished, so just bear with me. Um, bone tissue exists in our body, in our skeletal system, and I'm pretty sure everybody already knows that. You can see here in this little picture, it shows the bones of the leg. The largest bone in our body is your upper leg bone or your thigh bone is called the femur. And the picture that you're looking at here is a slide which is representative of what we call compact bone. So we have two types of bone tissue. One's called compact and one is called spongy. Now both bone types are hard. Just because we call the other type spongy bone does not mean it's soft. And again, we're going to get into the majority of that later uh, in the bone chapter. But in compact bone, pretty easy to identify. You have these circular structures that if we look at it in large, there's these little rings that go around. Those are called concentric lamellae. A lamellae or lamella, just A on the end would be singular, lamellae is plural. Lamellae are these little rings that we can see. And so if you look at a section through compact bone, it almost resembles a tree that was cut down. So if you ever notice a tree that's cut, you see the little rings everywhere on it? That's kind of what compact bone resembles. So these little ring structures that form these circles, those have a special name that I'm about to cover. And some of the structures that form this circular structure, we have to look to know as well. So all of the matrix of bone, that is to say all of the extracellular matrix on the outside of the cells is hard. So again, the osteocytes, which are the, the mature living bone cell, has to live in a hole that's in the hard matrix, the calcified matrix. So those little holes where the osteocytes are living are called lacunae. So here's a, one lacuna, and inside of that would be the osteocyte, right? Now, each one of these rings, like a ring around right here, a ring outer ring, another outer ring, so forth and so on. Each one of the rings is called a lamella or lamellae, plural. The lamellae is where the lacunae are located. So the holes or the lacunae are located on a ring of bone tissue called lamellae. And inside the lacunae are the osteocytes. At the very center of this circular structure, the very center is a canal, is called the central canal. The older name was called Haversian Canal. 
So I typically use the newer name now, Central Canal. Blood vessels run in there. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. But if you look at this little slide over here, this is another slide of bone tissue. This would be compact bone. This is compact bone. As soon as you see these circular structures that have some uh, common structure to them, like little trees that are cut down, you know you're looking at a slide of bone tissue, all right? So obviously those little bitty structures have a name. The name of those circular structures are called osteons. So compact bone contains osteons. Uh, you're gonna learn later that spongy bone does not contain a true osteon. But in the, in the middle here, I wrote out what, what's in there, what I just said. Osteocytes live in the lacunae. The lacunae are found on the lamellae. The lamellae, oh, I forgot to mention this one, the, the, the rings or the lamellae are all interconnected by little bitty canals called canaliculi. So these little canals right here that run from a lacunae and basically look like little hairs that run this way. All of those little hair looking structures is not hairs. Those are little bitty canals which are called canaliculi and it allows water and nutrients to flow through the bony matrix back and forth to all of the lacunae on the lamellae and back to the central canal. This is where the blood vessels are located that run in the central canal. So we have a diffusion of fluid and nutrients that go through the canals to all of the lamellae on all of the, on all of the lacunae on the lamellae to get to and from all the osteocytes. The osteocytes then dump in their waste product back into the fluid that flows back towards the blood vessels, which carry their waste products away. So ultimately our bone is very vascular. There's a lot of blood vessels in your bone. That's why you bleed a good bit when you break a bone. Your bone is involved in supporting everything and protecting everything in your body. Obviously our cranium protects our brain. Your ribs protect your lungs and your heart, so forth and so on, right? Your, the vertebrae in your vertebral column protect, protect your spinal cord. And then obviously your bone tissue is found in all the bones of the skeleton in the body. Now I added this little picture. We're specifically gonna cover this uh, when we do the bone chapter, but I wanted to include it now since we're talking about it. Here's compact bone right here. And then on this end is what we call spongy bone. So you notice the spongy bone on the end over here have these weird little bony plates that have holes in them. So those are called trabecula. Compact bone does not contain trabecula, which are these little plates of bony tissue. So we're gonna look at that more so when we do this bone model in the bone chapter. But I wanted to, to point out some of these names again. So here's an osteon. Each one of a complete circular structure is a different osteon. So here's one. Here would be one right here, and here's a half of one. Like the artist that drew the picture, cut it in half right here, but that would be one right there. This would be one here, so forth and so on. Running in the middle of an osteon, up and down with the uh, parallel to the bone are our blood vessels and what we call the central canal. There are other canals that run horizontally. We're gonna look at those later, but inside, of the osteon on each one of these rings, which is called a lamellae, is the hole called the lacunae where the osteocyte lives. So each one of these structures in there would be the lacunae, but that osteocyte is in there because I see the nucleus in there, all right? <clears throat> all right, here's just another couple pictures of bone tissue. You can see the osteon right here, there's one. Here's a central canal. Here's an osteon with the central canal, so forth and so on. Here's another slide of it. Even though the stain looks different, there's a commonality here, the osteons. So we see those little structures that look like trees that have been cut down because we can see the little rings everywhere around the central canal. All right, the last type of tissue that we have to get into is a liquid connective tissue, which is blood. So, we have all sorts of, of blood cells that we have to really identify them later, which ones they are later, but they might want you to at least know the basics. Um, on this practical, 
So let me just point out a couple of things. Here, here's a blood smear slide. Obviously, all of the little pink little discs in here, and I know that some of them look like little donuts, like it's hollow in the middle. It's not really hollow in the middle. Each one of these little pink discs is a red blood cell. And blood is red because you have many, many, many more red blood cells everywhere than you do white blood cells. So here's the distinction, it's pretty easy. White blood cells all have nuclei inside of their, inside the cell. All white blood cells have a nucleus. But notice the little pink or the red discs, there's no nucleus inside of them. Because mature red blood cells out in circulation do not contain a nucleus. But all white blood cells contain a dark blue or purple staining nucleus in there. All right, so we're going to learn how to identify these particular cells in AMP2, but I'll just tell you now, this is, the, and white blood cells are called leukocytes. If you don't know that, you need to know that name. The prefix leuco means white in Latin. So all of the leukocytes all have nuclei in them, but the red blood cells, which are called erythrocytes, do not. Erythro means red in Latin. So this particular white blood cell is called a neutrophil. It's one of the most abundant of the white blood cells. There's one there, here's one, there's one. This is even one over here. I'll let you know later on how I know how to identify which one they are. Now, the other type of, of cellular structure that's found in blood, besides red blood cells or the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, are the platelets. I'm sure you heard of platelets before. Platelets are involved in blood clotting, right? So that little bitty dot right there on the field of view, you can barely see it. That little dot and this one right here, those are platelets. Now down here, they enlarge it so you can see it. But a platelet is not a whole cell at all. It's actually a little bitty piece of a larger cell that it's splintered off of. So that's why it's so small. It's a lot smaller than a red blood cell. It looks like a little speck of nothing on the field of view. So that's a platelet, red blood cells and white blood cells. So our blood um, functions in transporting everything around our body. You guys know that. It transports your nutrients from the food you eat. It transports waste products to, uh, from your cells to excretory organs in the body. It transports certain types of immune system cells that we learn about later that are involved in protecting us against invading microbes or uh, viruses for that matter. Uh, it transports respiratory gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So basically hormones around the body, any medicines that you're taking, everything is being transported around the body via the blood, which is located obviously in all of your blood vessels and in your heart, basically in the cardiovascular system, right? So here's another slide of it. There's a white blood cell. Here's another slide. You can see they all look fairly similar. So the white blood cells will have the, the purple nucleus inside of it. And it looks like there's multiple nuclei here. There's not. There's really only one nucleus inside the cell, but it has these little lobules on it. And in fact, that's how I know this is a neutrophil because a neutrophil has three to five lobes on this nucleus, right? So that little speck over here, right there, that's a platelet. This little speck right here is a platelet, that little dot. And then all of these little discs everywhere are the red blood cells or the erythrocytes. So the erythrocytes are, are what we call anucleate. The mature cells don't have a nucleus in them. And that's one of the identifying characters. Besides the fact red blood cells are the most distributed of the cells in blood. It's the most concentrated of all the cells, all right? All right, so those are the connective tissues. So before I stop share, uh, sharing my screen, does anybody have any questions about any of the slides that I just went over? All right, so I'll stop sharing.